Before you all get started, everyone who has an ambiguous name, whether it be guest, could you please type your name in the chat for um, attendance purposes, please? Well, it's eight o'clock by my watch, people. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to thank you, everyone, for joining me this morning for uh, as we resume our ed Friday educational conferences and for grand rounds. Uh, everyone, please make sure that your audio is muted. And if you think of a question during the uh, talk, feel free to type it in on the chat area, and then I'll leave some time at the end so that we can try to field some questions. Uh, my name is Chuck Scoggins. I, I think I know just about everybody. Uh, I am the uh, I'm a member of the Division of Surgical Oncology, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about a topic I've been interested in for quite some time, which is soft tissue sarcomas of the extremity. And I'm going to try to link uh, some histologically specific management uh, and treatment decisions in there uh, towards the end. So if you'll uh, hang with me, take notes uh, if you want to, and type up some questions as we go along, uh, we'll get through this. Thank you. So let's start out with just a little bit of background. So extremity soft tissue sarcomas, we're going to uh, we're going to go through some of the statistics and epidemiology of this uh, broad disease category. Talk about how one might evaluate a patient suspected of having a sarcoma. Who needs a biopsy? What operation do you perform? Who really needs radiation therapy? And what is the role for chemotherapy in this disease? Well, soft tissue sarcomas are a relatively rare disease. Most recent data from, from uh, the NIH shows there's just shy of 13,000 cases of sarcoma in the US every year. That's not very many when you consider that there's uh, close to 350 million Americans. The incidence of soft tissue sarcomas mirror that of cervical cancer and laryngeal cancer. So that's what we're talking about here. It's less than 1% of all adult tumors, but if you spend a uh, Thursday with me in clinic, it seems like uh, a third of patients have these. And um, it's a little bit more common in the pediatric population. I'm going to spend my time today talking about adult soft tissue sarcomas, and I would leave a pediatric soft tissue sarcomas for our pediatric surgeons. We're going to focus our efforts today on uh, diseases of the limbs. So you're really talking uh, about half of the cases of uh, sarcomas here. Just some general data uh, of all comers, about 10% of patients will present with metastatic disease, meaning that 9 out of 10 uh, that surgery really does have a role in their care. Half of patients will relapse, and the most common place to relapse is in the lungs. A third uh, will relapse locally, and if it's a truly a local recurrence, then, then there still is a role for salvage uh, surgery. And 10% of patients will relapse in multiple sites. So if you have a patient who has a soft tissue sarcoma come back, say, in their thigh a few years after you've taken care of it, uh, you really need to do an exhaustive uh, evaluation to make sure that the patient doesn't have distant metastatic disease as well. Most recurrences do happen relatively soon, like most cancers. Within about two years, you're going to get most of the patients who are going to have a recurrence. There are some latecomers, though, especially when you're talking about um, liposarcomas. There are several things that are known to cause sarcomas, and some of these show up on exams during January for residents. So um, there, are th there are several chemicals you can see there that are, that are well known to cause hepatic angiosarcomas. And a lot of this work was actually done here at the University of Louisville um, based on the uh, patients coming out of the rubber plants in Rubbertown. Patients who have chronic lymphedema can develop a stuart treves syndrome, and uh, I think that anybody who does a significant amount of breast cancer care has seen a patient or two with this. Radiation can cause uh, sarcomas. This is a, the patient of Dr. Ikeis who had a partial mastectomy and radiation some years back, and she comes in with this, and a punch biopsy on the, this lesion here uh, shows that this is a, an angiosarcoma. Angiosarcomas of the breast can occur uh, de novo, and they can also occur after radiation. Certainly, there are some genetic conditions that predispose one to developing sarcoma, and the one that is most frequently talked about is Lee-Fermini syndrome, 
which is a mutation in P53, the tumor suppressor gene. The patients you need to think of with Lee Fermini syndrome would be someone who's young with sarcoma, Certainly, cancer you can see there, that's brain, adrenal, leukemia. If you have a patient that's in their 30s with a sarcoma and they got somebody in their family with one of these other cancers, little bells should go off in your head and you need to think about genetic testing for that patient. So let's say, what are we gonna do if we have a patient in the office who's suspected of having a soft tissue sarcoma? How are we gonna evaluate them? Well, first, we're gonna go through history. We're gonna talk, we're gonna talk to the patient about how long has it been there? Is it growing rapidly? Does it give symptoms like pain or is it hard? Are there neurologic symptoms suggesting that the, that the tumor might be either arising from or involving a peripheral nerve? What about the physical location of the tumor? Size, fixation, when you, when you grasp the tumor in your hand, can you, is it mobile, can you move it or does it feel fixed to underlying structures like bone? This is important stuff to know and the consistency of the tumor. I would submit to you that the vast majority of lumps and bumps that you see as a surgeon are not sarcomas. And it would be prohibitively costly to be ordering MRIs on everybody who has a soft tissue lump uh, that you see at the VA, for example. But clues that might up the ante and make you be more suspicious of something more sinister would be uh, it's growing really fast, it's rock hard, or it has a, a it's soft in one area, but rock hard in, in another area. These th are things that might tip you off that something uh, uh, more than just a lipoma is happening here. Anybody who has something that's either known to be a sarcoma or suspected of being a sarcoma needs some cross-sectional imaging. So this is a woman who has a uh, Stuart Treve syndrome. You can see here, her uh, grossly edematous arm, and then this gigantic sarcoma growing here uh, right near her shoulder or girdle. This is a, a terrible, terrible problem. And in this woman, it really is, is unfixable. Um, I'm sorry, this image is a little bit blurry, but this is a, a, a grossly distorted forearm, kind of a bilobed tumor here uh, that's also a soft tissue sarcoma. When it comes to cross-sectional imaging, which one's best? It's a little bit dealer's choice. CT or MRI, good quality CT scans can tell you uh, a ton of information, especially fine anatomic detail um, when you're planning uh, treatment, for example. An MR can give you the same type of information. MR probably gives you a little bit more information um, because some tissues will, uh, will show up a little bit differently in the different uh, weighted images in the MR you should really order the one that you are most comfortable with. If you're facile at reading MRIs, that, that might be the way to go. But if you really have not uh, mastered MRI uh, reading and you're be far better at CT scans, then CT will tell you just about everything you need to know for local care of uh, sarcoma. Ultrasound might be done uh, early on in the evaluation, but there's probably little role for ultrasonography when planning therapy. Here's an example of a very large uh, soft tissue sarcoma on the, on the hip of a, a young woman. And uh, first off, you can see that the sarcoma is almost as big as her pelvis. And then second, um, if you pay attention, you can see that there's a tissue plane between it and her. So this, this is critically important. Uh, one could imagine uh, uh, just coming right through here to remove this, this uh, gigantic uh, gross tumor. Here's some uh, other examples of a soft tissue sarcoma I saw in the office, and you can see that, uh, that the bone here and here is far away from the tumor, even though when, when on exam, this tumor felt almost fixed. And I, I thought there was a high chance of it involving bone when I examined it, but you can clearly see there's a lot of distance between it and the bone. And I think maybe it felt, um, I, I misinterpreted it as being fixed because of its expansile nature within the muscle compartment. And it was just sort of sort of rigid when I grasped it and tried to move it. Um, more data here, you can, you can see this is destruction of this bone. If you pay, uh, you can look at the cortex here of this, of this bone here in a calf and it is uh, being destroyed by uh, tumor more images here. So you can get a lot of information if you know what to look for.
Well, if you have a patient with a soft with a soft tissue tumor, uh, say you got somebody in, in the office and they've got something in their thigh, and you maybe it grew a little fast, maybe it's a little more firm, and you think ah, I'm not comfortable with this being just a plain lipoma. Uh, I don't feel like uh, I know exactly what's going on here. Maybe you would consider a preoperative biopsy. And I think a, a preoperative biopsy is uh, not necessary if you're convinced this is a small little lipoma or a sebaceous cyst or something like that. Just take the thing out. I don't think you've hurt anything by doing that. But if it's in a, a bad location or uh, you think, uh, I, this might be more than just a lipoma, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing a biopsy. You won't mess anything up. You do not spread uh, tumor cells if you do the biopsy correctly. I would do a biopsy if the diagnosis were unclear or if, uh, if we had a research protocol where we were going to give patients neoadjuvant therapy, uh, or if I thought that neoadjuvant therapy might improve the odds of either doing, uh, getting the tumor out or improve the patient's outcome, or if I thought it might, uh, it might make the uh, operation easier. And then finally, if I felt like the patient had stage four disease, maybe they had a chest X-ray that showed uh, metastases, and I needed a diagnosis so that the patient could undergo some palliative therapy, then then uh, a biopsy uh, is a good idea. You can do a biopsy in a multiple ways. If the, if the question is is this cancer, then an FNA is reasonable to do. Um, you can do the FNAs work great for thyroid nodules. They work great for uh, a cutaneous nodule, and you think is a metastatic melanoma, patient who had a history of melanoma. You can do an FNA or on a lymph node. If, if the question is, is it malignant? Yes or no. But if you are trying to tell architecture, or if you need to perform immunohistochemistry to differentiate between liposarcoma versus lamosarcoma versus whatever, then you need more tissue. Uh, than you get with an FNA. And now you're talking about either a surgical biopsy or a core needle biopsy. And core needle biopsies are easy to do in the office. You can do them uh, with a little local anesthetic and a true cut needle biopsy. It gives you a little core that you can send to the laboratory. The patients tolerate it very well. If it's superficial, uh, many times you don't even have to have them stop their, their anticoagulants. Uh, you can just do it. It's, it's super easy to do it. I, I do a lot of them in the office. An incisional biopsy can also be done if a core needle uh, was done and, and you either missed, you got a sampling error, or there was some, uh, some issue, maybe all you got was myxoid material and you needed more tissue, then an incisional biopsy can be done. And certainly if it's a small tumor, you can just excise the thing as a biopsy. Uh, that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And you've not hurt the patient by doing an excisional biopsy on a very small tumor. So, for example, if you had, uh, let's say, one of the re chief residents sees a patient in the surgery clinic at the VA, and they've got a two-centimeter uh, hard thing on, on the lateral thigh, far away from all the important stuff, not right over a joint, plenty of tissue to get it closed, you know, all, all the favorable things you're thinking about. It, there's nothing wrong with just excising the thing and sending it to pathology. If it can, comes back a benign process, you've cured it. If it comes back a soft tissue sarcoma, you've got a great biopsy and you've not messed up anything for the patient. They can still undergo margin negative resection. They could undergo radiation if they needed it. They could get chemotherapy if they needed it. So you've not hurt the patient at all. Uh, this is uh, not the way we do a biopsy. This is uh, this might be the way that that it's done down in Houston, but. Uh, we don't do biopsies like this anymore, although those hats look really good. Uh, this is a proper way of doing an, an incisional biopsy. What you'll notice here, if you pay close attention, is that the biopsy incision should be made along the axis of the extremity, okay? Just along, right along an axial-based incision. That is key, key, key. You would think that everybody knows this, and you would be wrong. Here's an example. Here's a soft tissue tumor on a person's shoulder. You can see here it's kind of outlined by the uh, ink dots. And uh, you can see that this is kind of a superficial lesion and would be easy to do a core needle biopsy in the office. But instead, this person has undergone an incisional biopsy the exact opposite direction that it needs to go, okay? This came back a high-grade sarcoma, and the patient had to have 
an operation to get it, and you have to excise the, the biopsy scar. That's the reason for the axial-based incision. The biopsy scar has to be excised. So this person ended up with uh, a complex rotational flap, and you can see that this operation was far more complicated than it needed to be. Any, any ideas uh, what's wrong with this biopsy? It seems to be uh, axial-based, somewhat axial-based. How about this? So uh, first off, a Penrose drain, are you kidding me? What year was this? Um, this is gonna have to be excised and the drain track is gonna have to be excised. And if there was a hematoma under here, that hematoma, that expansile hematoma, that entire hematoma capsule would have to be excised because a hematoma does have the ability to spread tumor cells. So if, if you're gonna do a biopsy, do it well and think, Am I gonna, is my biopsy gonna complicate this patient's care? And if you don't know, send it to somebody who does or ask. But a, a, a true cut needle biopsy um, can, can really give you the answers you need and avoid an operation the patient doesn't need. Think of it like a stereotactic breast biopsy. You can get the majority of women's breast masses diagnosed and the treatment uh, properly aligned off of a needle biopsy. You don't have to be doing uh, incisional biopsies on breasts very often. It should be a, a very uncommon event. Well, as with most uh, tumors, uh, we, we use tumor staging. I'm not going to go through the uh, TNM uh, staging system in detail, but for sarcomas, uh, obviously tumor size matters, the histology matters, uh, for, for prognosis location uh, matters. And then uh, certainly if the patient has distant disease that, that uh, impacts their prognosis. This is a little bit of the, uh, from the, from the TNM staging system, uh, something that's unique to sarcomas is the uh, histologic tumor differentiation that goes into the staging of a patient. So a very low uh, score tumor differentiation would be a well-differentiated liposarcoma. You may read in some, by some authors, the, the phrase atypical lipomatous tumor. That's a phrase that's often used uh, by the pathologists that are trained at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, others uh, will, will use well-differentiated liposarcoma. For all intents and purposes, atypical lipomatous tumor and well-differentiated liposarcoma are the same thing. Same thing. Middle of the road sarcomas you can see here, and then uh, this, this column over here are the bad actors. Um, round cell liposarcoma. You will notice that the word liposarcoma is in the bad column and also in the not so bad column uh, and in the middle column. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but, but there, there are a lot of sarcomas that, uh, that are biologically aggressive and require special attention. Nodal metastases can happen uh, in sarcomas and a mnemonic that I teach the residents is SCARE. Synovial, clear cell, angio, rhabdo, and epithelioid. The scare sarcomas have a risk of nodal metastasis that mirrors that of melanoma. So if you would think about doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy on somebody who has a 20% chance of a nodal metastasis for a melanoma, why wouldn't you think about the same thing for a patient with a, a sarcoma that has a 20% chance of nodal metastasis? So even though all comers Nodal metastases are uncommon in sarcomas. For the scare sarcomas, uh, we would consider a sentinel lymph node biopsy. <clears throat> it's really done the same way. I, you inject the, uh, the peritumoral tissue with the same agents you use for, for melanoma or breast cancer, and uh, the, the technology works really well. I find it per particularly helpful in epithelioid sarcomas uh, because of the very high risk for sentinel node metastasis and because those patients will uh, usually get radiation therapy. So when you think epithelioid, I think a young woman with a pelvic girdle uh, soft tissue sarcoma. That, that's epithelioid until proven otherwise. So tumor size matters. Uh, multiple authors have shown that uh, the bigger the tumor, the, the, the lower the survival. 
Obviously, distant metastatic disease impacts survival. So this is a, this chest X-ray is grossly abnormal. One can see uh, too numerous to count uh, metastases here. <clears throat> you can also see this patient's infusion uh, port. So you've got a patient, you've diagnosed with a sarcoma, you've done your uh, due diligence with uh, maybe or maybe not a pre-op biopsy, imaging, and the decision is made, okay, this patient needs an operation. So as late as the the late 70s, I know that seems like an eternity ago, there were, are some of us here uh, who were alive during the 70s, you know, thanks Star Wars, patients got a, a radical amputation. So if you had a five centimeter sarcoma in your mid thigh, away from all the important structures, uh, structures, in structures like the bones, the nerves, the arteries, then you got an amputation. And analogous to the change in thought with breast cancer, away from the Halsteadian uh, uh, mastectomy to modify radical mastectomy, now to lumpectomy. So you've gone. Uh, data has allowed us to change our trajectory and what we're going to do for the woman. It, the same is true for sarcoma. So we used to do radical amputations on everybody, and then it went to compartmentectomy. So uh, the anterior thigh compartment would be excised. To now, it's really a quote lumpectomy. You're doing a limb sparing operation where you're excising the tumor and hopefully a rim of of healthy tissue, one to two centimeters if you can get it. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are some. Uh, limb perfusion trials that for very advanced extremity sarcomas. These are mostly Dutch trials with varying results. If you talk to Lynn Heikstra from uh, from Holland, uh, everybody with an extremity soft tissue sarcoma should be uh, considered for one of his limb perfusion trials. But interestingly, he's the only person in the world that can seem to get it to work that way. And when that's the case, uh, you should really question uh, the applicability of that technology. So in the U.S., uh, limb perfusion for advanced sarcomas, limb perfusion and limb infusion uh, really uh, should be done on a on a trial basis. There are some centers here in the U.S. who that are conducting trials for that. So uh, we talked about uh, in the in the 1970s, uh, you, you would have been at risk for having uh, received a radical amputation for your sarcoma of your thigh, uh, and it worked. F honestly, you had a very low, uh, very at low risk for local recurrence, extremely good control of local disease. The problem, of course, is that we talked about earlier that half of patients relapse with distant disease. So patients still died from METs despite missing a leg. So let's say we've got our patient in the office and we're and we're looking at the scans, we've we've evaluated them, and uh, now we're asking ourselves, can we get this out? We gotta we, you have to put on your your creative hat and think, uh, can I get this tumor out? Can I get around the tumor with a rim of uh, margin, healthy margin tissue, uh, preserving the critical structures like the femur or uh, sciatic nerve or um, or the vessels. Now, realizing that these structures uh, can be resected and reconstructed, but you get the point, there's a lot of uh, decision-making. Do I need help? So if, uh, if I'm gonna take the femoral artery, do I need uh, one of our vascular surgery colleagues to help? Or if I need to take a mid-shaft femur, uh, I'm gonna have to get one of the orthopedists to uh, reconstruct that. Do I need plastics? I use plastics a lot. Our plastic surgery colleagues are critical for having advanced sarcoma practice. Will radiation make my operation easier or better? And if so, what type of radiation? Are we talking about standard external beam radiotherapy? Are you talking about brachytherapy? All these things have to be planned. So here's a here's an intraoperative photo. You can see a patient with a uh, large thigh sarcoma and this this thing involving uh, this tubular structure here that carries blood to and fro. So this is this is a, a the uh, femoral artery, and uh, Dr. Davidi had to uh, replace that for me. But we knew that going in, we we had uh, planned. The patient had seen him preoperatively. We got ABIs. We did all the things that we needed to do to make sure that we could do a safe planned operation. So it's much more fun to call your uh, colleagues and say, "Okay, I'm ready for you," as opposed to calling them and saying, "Hey, 
I had this problem and I need help. This is a patient who had a, a, a soft tissue sarcoma resected and you can see these weird catheters spaced one centimeter apart across the wound here. These are brachytherapy catheters that we've placed into the wound and uh, we're getting ready to close this wound and then uh, five days from now this patient will have radioactive wires loaded inside each one of these little tubes. The radiation oncologists uh, use some sophisticated dosimetry planning to calculate exactly how much radioactive material goes on the wires spaced out across the entire wound. So they use some sophisticated uh, methods to determine which wire goes where and for how long. They know to the minute how long that wire is going to stay in. Here's, here's what it would look like uh, in the post-op uh, recover in the recovery room. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention that uh, brachytherapy is particularly uh, attractive option for patients who, who've had, uh, maybe they had prior radiation and they've got a recurrence and you're thinking, you know what, I think a little additional radiation might help us here, but we're worried about toxicity. So brachytherapy would have a lower risk for um, skin necrosis and um, affecting bone. Maybe it's near the joint and you want to minimize radiation to the joint in a patient who is prone to develop uh, arthritis. So it does, it does give you options. It's not without potential complications. Everything has potential complications, but it does open up the possibility of re-rating a wound uh, or um, minimizing radiation delivery to something you're trying to prevent, like a hip. Here's an example of a patient with a very large, uh, terrible uh, sarcoma. Now you say, oh, that doesn't look that big. That's, you know, what is that? Uh, that's a ping pong ball. Well, I, I would submit to you that's just the tip of the iceberg. And you can see this gigantic sarcoma on this patient. We treated this man with, with uh, external beam radiotherapy and then, and then excised it. And so we, with the help of the plastic surgeons, a flap was taken down to reconstruct his anterior thigh. And this worked beautifully. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're back to her. You remember this lady? We talked about her a little while ago. We talked about this tissue plane here. And this is what she looked like. This thing uh, was broken down, um, smelly, painful. This is a young woman. She hated this god awful thing. So we excised it and then closed it. You can see she required a little bit of a, she required a, a rotational flap, a skin graft. Uh, and I would submit to you, this, this is a far better uh, outcome than this. So what, what are we trying to achieve with surgery for sarcomas of the extremity? We're trying to achieve negative margins. The question is how much is enough? Do you need two centimeters? Do you need three centimeters? Well, the goal is to achieve a margin negative resection. Here's your goal. You're trying to shoot for that. And uh, I, I usually try to measure out uh, two centimeter margins grossly when, I, when I'm marking the incision, but realizing that the tumor and its in its proximity to uh, vital structures will dictate how much margin you can get. So if the tumor comes down and is within millimeters of the femur, you're not getting a two centimeter margin. Margins do impact uh, patient outcome. You can see here on these data that the local recurrence is far higher for patients who have a more positive resection. These data uh, were published in the Annals of Surgical Oncology. Um, Jesus seems like not very long ago, but now you're talking 12 years ago. And you can see that patients' uh, risk of recurrence is far higher if they have a um, low-grade survival, um, I'm sorry, a low-grade soft tissue sarcoma and a local recurrence. So if, you, if the patient has a recurrence of their sarcoma uh, from a positive margin, then their survival is, um, is worse. So it, this is kind of graph is the upside down. So death from distant disease, higher for patients who have local recurrence, death from distant disease, lower if you have no local recurrence. So it matters controlling 
uh, the disease in the leg or the arm. It matters, not just because, uh, well, now you got to go back and retreat that thigh. It impacts the patient's survival. How do we manage someone who's had uh, a, an operation and they've got a positive margin or a very close margin? So if the patient underwent uh, an excisional biopsy and had positive margins, I would re-excise that to negative margins. And this actually is a, a common scenario where a patient is referred after one of the general surgeons excised some uh, small subcutaneous thing. They thought it was a, a benign process and it comes back uh, a sarcoma. Uh, so much like uh, you, much of the melanoma surgery is excising a biopsy scar, um, a lot of soft tissue sarcoma surgery is excising a biopsy scar. Now, timing of this, uh, this excision probably doesn't uh, impact survival, meaning it's not an emergency. If a patient comes to see me on Thursday and they've had uh, a margin positive excisional biopsy of a uh, soft tissue sarcoma, uh, you don't have to book it next week. Uh, you have time to um, get your scans, make considerations, I oftentimes will discuss patients with, uh, with the uh, radiation oncologist uh, on the medical oncologist, depending on the histology. You have, the point is you have time to put on the brakes, think about things, uh, and get your ducks in a row. I wouldn't want to wait six months, but um, last year I had a, a student at UofL came to see me, I think it was mid-April, and they were coming up on their finals. And... They had a liposarcoma of the thigh that had been excised. Uh, I believe it was about three or four centimeters in size. And we got some staging, no evidence for metastatic disease. Uh, so we just booked the surgery for after their finals and it worked out great. It does matter. It does impact the patient's survival to re-excise to negative margins. So you can see uh, for disease-free survival and overall survival for patients who come with a positive resection margin, you take them back to the operating room, re-excise it to negative margins, you do impact their survival. So this is an important uh, thing to remember to do. What about radiation? You can't have a, a sarcoma talk without talking about radiation because it plays such an important role in patient's care. Radiation can be given preoperatively or ne neoadjuvant, if you will. It can be given intraoperatively. It can be given postoperatively. Now, postoperative radiation can be the more common external beam radiation therapy, or it can be brachytherapy like those catheters I just showed you a few minutes ago. When you look at all the data, you know, you're talking about, um, first off, look at the uh, radiation doses. These are real radiation doses, by the way. This is, this is real radiation. Um, it probably... I'm, I'm, it probably doesn't matter from a uh, disease control standpoint, whether you give radiation therapy preoperatively or postoperatively. Now, it might matter from some other reasons, but from just strictly controlling the cancer, pre-op radiation versus post-op radiation is probably dealer's choice. Now, if you, if you work in a center where uh, the culture is uh, heavily weighted toward preoperative radiotherapy, fine. If you work in a center where the culture is the opposite, then that's fine too. Uh, as long as you have an approach and a plan. Now, there are some um, benefits to preoperative radiotherapy that um, are important and should be considered, such as the patient gets a lower dose of radiation therapy if they get it pre-op it's delivered more accurately. You can shoot a rabbit, you can see, you can't shoot him if you're just, you know, you're not gonna hit him if you're just aiming in the area he used to be. Um, uh, the patients uh, tolerate the pre-op radiation really well. And there are some data to suggest that pre-op radiation enhances your ability to get a margin negative resection. It probably kills some of the peripheral cells and makes a uh, margin negative resection uh, this much easier. So I'm not 
gonna I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you that you have radiation therapy, but uh, I'm a believer in pre-operation therapy. And and the and the, the radiation college, oncologists frankly have a much more accurate uh, satisfying uh, treatment for them if they can see the thing and aim at the thing as opposed to aiming at a wound bed that has some clips in it and the clips always get shifted a little bit when you close the wound so it's it, it's better in uh, in my opinion for that reason I do think that there are some wide uh, category statements you can make about radiation for sarcoma so first off for low-grade tumors let's say a well diff liposarcoma with a negative margin and a small tumor less than five centimeters, maybe you don't need to radiate that person. Their chance for local recurrence is gonna be very low and uh, maybe you don't have to radiate that person. If it's a high grade tumor, you need to consider radiation therapy. If you got a close margin, you need to consider radiation therapy. Like if the tumor was near the femur, but you were able to get it out, you, you probably should radiate that. If it's a big tumor, you need to consider radiation therapy. And certainly if you're dealing it with a recurrence. So, so you can see that that's a lot of the patients there uh, who you need to consider radiation therapy. Consider doesn't mean have to have, you, you need to consider. Uh, these are some data uh, from Jonathan Zagers uh, showing that uh, pre-op versus post-op, no difference in local control. We talked about that a little bit. And we talked a little bit about this here, um, very large tumor, close to a vital structure, high-grade tumor, I think pre-op radiation therapy works. Radiation is not a freebie, and we're not talking about dollars here. We're talking about complications. The real risk for radiation therapy from an acute standpoint is wound complications. You can see a very high risk for, comp for wound problems with radiation. And if you give preoperative radiation, you are usually talking about plastic surgery uh, having to, to help close that wound. I'm talking about rotational flaps, skin grafts, things like that. So, so there is a cost to preoperative radiation. There's no question about that. Now on to a more controversial topic, chemotherapy for extremity sarcomas. So uh, realizing that the, uh, the given a rare disease, that there's not a ton of effort uh, put into drug development for extremity sarcomas. I'm not saying there's none, but it's vastly different than for breast cancer, for example. So the response rates with the limited number of drugs we have available for sarcomas is, is not very good. Um, when you start combining drugs like uh, a recipe called AIM or MAID, you're now talking about a little bit higher rates. So like many cancers, uh, when you start combining drugs, uh, you develop uh, uh, multi-drug uh, regimens, then the res response rates are higher. The two most commonly used drugs you can see here, uh, doxy and ophosphamide, very toxic. They, they both have 100% cumulative toxicity. There's only a certain amount of doxorubicin a patient can have before they develop cardiomyopathy. So uh, if you're giving somebody, going to give somebody chemotherapy, you're talking about getting a, a pre-treatment echocardiogram uh, and things like that. And if the patient had pre-existing heart issues, uh, that might take that, that treatment option off the table. I put a question mark under immunotherapy because uh, it's just not known. Certainly patients whose tumor has a known chromosomal translocation uh, might be more amenable to immunotherapy. Those tumors seem to be a little bit more immunogenic, but the vast majority of, of sarcomas uh, are, are not very immunogenic. Um, we're not gonna spend much time talking about Kaposi's sarcoma uh, because uh, uh, it's not a, a very common disease, but certainly patients with altered immune function have Kaposi's sarcoma. And interestingly, PD-1 inhibitors seem to work pretty well, despite the, the immunosuppression. So an HIV patient, for example, um, uh, you often see them on PD-1 inhibitors for their Kaposi's sarcoma. Now, chemotherapy, like radiation therapy, can give in a neoadjuvant uh, fashion. Um, certainly, I would consider it if I thought it was going to help uh, with, my, with the operation. If it was a tumor type that uh, I thought would respond and, and become the tumor might be smaller and make the operation easier. Um, 
certainly, uh, like with all cancers, if you treat immune in a neoadjuvant fashion and uh, the tumor shrinks, you have a in situ biomarker for response. Um, patients who have life limiting disease, like an extra osseous Ewing sarcoma, uh, getting them on early, early therapy uh, is a good idea. And I really, there are, there are several histologic types of sarcomas where neoadjuvant chemotherapy probably uh, is, is, is in, on the front of the list. An example would be like an, an IBC lyomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Really, IBC lyomyosarcoma sarcomas, you're, you're talking about neoadjuvant chemotherapy, neoadjuvant radiation, and surgery. Adjuvant chemotherapy certainly can be done. That's probably the more common scenario, um, realizing that not not all sarcomas need chemotherapy. Many are cured with good operation. And frankly, chemotherapy across the board has not been proven to help with sarcomas. But if you break histologically based, I think you'll tease out some histologies that, that are, um, are benefited from routine chemotherapy administration. An example would be rhabdomyosarcomas, even though uh, pretty unusual in an extremity, rhabdomyosarcoma uh, is a, a histology where I would refer them for chemotherapy. This was a, uh, a small uh, phase two study looking at uh, resection and plus minus radiation therapy and then adjuvant chemotherapy for, versus observation. And in this small study, you can see a, uh, a benefit uh, to patients who receive adjuvant chemotherapy versus those for observation. Um, this is really, this study doesn't prove anything. It, what it does is it is uh, hypothesis generating and has led to other studies uh, to test chemotherapy. This was a uh, large uh, review done by Janice Cormier where uh, showed the exact opposite. Uh, chemotherapy, for, chemotherapy, no chemotherapy. This was combined data from the MD Anderson Cancer Center and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it kind of put the brakes on, on uh, people getting chemotherapy for every histology. So the bottom line for chemotherapy is that, well, you know it's toxic. Um, there are modest response rate given today's available drugs. Um, patients with metastatic disease, that's an, that's an easy one uh, for chemotherapy. But his, some histologies do respond. Here's some of the five-year survival. So if you've got a stage one disease, great survival. By the time you get to stage three disease, it's half, half the patients are surviving uh, five years. So I would like to submit to you in the last uh, little bit we have that histology indicates tumor biology. I made a category here that I, call, that I think of as low risk tumors and uh, DFSP, well diff liposarcoma and cutaneous lyomyosarcomas sarcomas are low risk disease low risk for local recurrence, low risk for metastatic disease. And then there's high risk tumors you can see here. I'm gonna, and I, I tried to pick ones that I see more commonly in the office. It would take a month to go through every histology there is. So I really wanted to focus on uh, some of the ones that we see in the office uh, more routinely. So this is what DFSP looks like. It's a little purple module. Uh, and interestingly, it seems to occur more commonly around the inguinal crease. Uh, these are low-grade tumors, uh, meaning uh, a very low risk for metastatic disease, uh, close to less than 1%. The problem with this disease is this. It has these little finger-like extensions, microscopic little tendrils, if you will, that creep in through the tissue that you can't see or feel. That produces this issue, local control. Local control with DFSP is the problem. So if local control is the problem, then chemotherapy probably doesn't have a role in this disease. What you need to treat this with is wide margins. And when I say wide, I'm talking three to five centimeters. And I would not use radiation therapy unless I was dealing with some god awful, unresectable local recurrence and I was trying to do some salvage thing. Interestingly, some groups are using Mohs micrographic surgery to map out the finger-like extension. So the dermatologists do Mohs and maybe they map out that it looks like this. Now you have your margins drawn out where you can go full thickness all the way down to the muscular fascia beneath and, and, and excise all of the disease. I think that's an interesting concept. 
and I've used it twice, uh, both the times for recurrent disease in a more cosmetically difficult area, a functionally difficult area over a joint. And so I, I felt like it helped. But this patient right here comes to see me in the office with a two centimeter purple module that a biopsy shows a DFSP. I would just excise that with three centimeter margins if I can and, and check the margins there. Another thing that we've done in the office is pre-op biopsies. So you can, you can uh, map this out, you know, 12, two, four, six, eight. So do take a two millimeter punch biopsy two centimeters away and sort of map out the periphery. I think that is a, uh, a way to increase the odds of having a negative margin. It's not a perfect way because you certainly could have tumor cells creeping between the uh, two of the, the biopsy sites, but it will help uh, somewhat. So this one you'll see uh, relatively commonly in your office. All liposarcomas are not the same. I showed you that uh, that uh, grading chart, grades one, two, and three, and lipo, the word liposarcoma was in each column. Uh, some liposarcomas are low grade, but but grossly deform a thigh. Look at this. Look at this thigh. This thing. This guy's got skinny little legs, and he's got this gigantic thing in his posterior thigh. This is a local control problem. Here's a high grade round cell liposarcoma. This is a very nasty local control and distant control problem. This, this is a tu terrible tumor and you, this patient uh, is gonna need an amputation. This is just gonna need an excision of the tumor, although that's a big operation. It really is a soft tissue uh, operation here. And I think that this man lost a little bit of skin and fat and a very thin rim of muscle to get a negative margin, but that's it. And uh, he's, I did this, God, that was eight, 10 years ago and he's still disease free. And this man's already dead. Uh, from his from metastatic disease. So liposarcomas, some are well differentiated. Um, if you had to choose one for your leg, this is the one you want. This is a local control issue. So your therapy needs to be geared for local control. Resection only if it's a small, well diff liposarcoma. That's a reasonable approach. Reserving radiation should they have a recurrence. Resection radiation for a large tumor, or for it's a recurrence, or if it's near a vital structure. High grade liposarcomas. Now you're dealing with the, the potential for metastatic disease. So you're talking the same local control issues, resection and radiation, but now you're also talking about should we, should we be given chemotherapy? And if a patient had a very high grade uh, liposarcoma or a round cell liposarcoma, a round cell is just another way of spelling high grade, then, then probably, yeah, you probably need to be considering chemotherapy because that patient has a very high risk for pulmonary metastases. If they had a mixoid liposarcoma, mixoid meaning that sort of gelatinous um, uh, material that's in the tumor, and oftentimes when you do the needle biopsy in the office, that gelatinous junk will leak out through the through the, the hole, and you got to put a little uh, chromic stitch in it. Mixoid liposarcomas have a have a um, lower overall cell count. The cells are dispersed in this mixoid material, um, so um, they're probably a little bit less sensitive to chemotherapy, and I might reserve chemotherapy in that scenario for um, a, a, a metastasis. But I definitely would have the, the discussion with the uh, medical oncologist. How about cutaneous lyomyositis sarcoma? You can see that this looks sort of like the DFSP, except this usually is a little more pink, uh, more skin colored. The vast majority of these are low-grade tumors. They're usually on the leg of an older patient, and the issue is local. So excise it and reserve radiation or high grade laminal sarcoma, or if uh, there's another issue, large recurrence near a vital structure. How about mixofibrosarcoma? This is a terrible problem. And it, I don't know, maybe, maybe our referral patterns have changed, but I'm seeing more and more of this. It's usually older gentlemen, uh, usually in the leg. They're typically high grade, super nasty tumors. They have an extremely high risk for local recurrence. They seem to have a lower risk for pulmonary metastases, but it's certainly not zero. Uh, at least a third of these patients within five years will develop metastatic disease. The problem is you're dealing with older, older folks and their ability to tolerate MAID and AIM seems to be less. So the issues with these patients are mostly local. So think your local therapies, think surgery, think radiation, and watch for metastatic disease. That's been our approach. Um, there was a, a small study put out uh, talking, looking at uh, wider margin radiation therapy, and you can see the results here. Local recurrence risk at five years, one third, distant met, 17%. So this is a real disease here that, um, you know, that, that can really be um, 
affect uh, older gentlemen in a bad way. How about pleomorphic uh, sarcoma, undifferentiated uh, sarcoma? This is the old uh, MFH, the, the Dr. McMaster's will remember MFH uh, a lot. So this is a high grade tumor. This is a terrible, terrible, nasty tumor. Uh, probably an equal distribution between upper uh, and lower extremities. It has a very high metastatic potential. So um, again, high metastatic potential, you're thinking local control issues with surgery and radiation, and you're thinking distant control issues. But what about a patient uh, that, that on pre-op imaging has, already has metastatic disease? This is just one image off of a chest CT, and you can, you can already see one, two, three, four, probably five, five mets on that one image. And if you scroll up and down in this patient's uh, uh, chest CT, you can see multiple metastases. So is there a role for resection of a primary sarcoma in a patient who already has stage four disease? Maybe. This is a, this is a patient we treated recently. And if the patient has bad symptoms from their primary tumor, then, then taking care of the primary tumor makes sense. If there's compromised skin, you can see this skin is dead and sloughing. This is already starting to smell. Certainly if there's infection or some other thing like that that you need to take care of. And I put in quotes, easy to do. You can see this is on the back of a lady's arm. Her, her uh, CT scan showed it was far away from all the important things in her arm. So this operation took 30 minutes to do. So it was easy to get rid of this thing, even in the setting of, of metastatic disease. So I felt like taking this symptomatic, terrible thing off her arm is gonna have a very low chance for having a complication that would inhibit our ability to treat her metastatic disease. So we took it off. Angiosarcomas, very aggressive, extremely aggressive. You can see in this, this is a scalp, this is a, uh, on an older gentleman, but th this is one of the better images I had on my, on my phone. Uh, it's usually older folks, often farmers get these from uh, prolonged sun exposure. And these things have uh, local control issues because they send out these little tendrils throughout the tissue. This, it, this patient had to have a massive amount of their scalp excised with a wound vac on their head until we had negative margins. And then Dr. McCurry reconstructed it. Uh, radiation therapy, and then if the patient can tolerate it, um, I usually refer these folks for chemotherapy because their risk of metastatic disease is super high. High-grade lyomyositis sarcoma. So we talked about low-grade lyomyositis sarcomas a minute ago. Some of them are very high-grade. You can see this one here on this this shoulder. Interestingly, uh, lyomyositis sarcomas usually arise from a vein. It's almost never an artery. They can be very fast-growing and uh, have early metastatic uh, disease. So again local control issues and systemic issues. Um, this patient, uh, we did refer for chemotherapy, even though he has no evidence for metastatic disease because he was a relatively healthy gentleman and uh, he had a very high grade lyomyositis sarcoma with a lot of very bizarre cells on the microscope. So in summary, uh, uh, for soft tissue sarcomas, a good operation is the best chance the patient has. It's in your hands and, and what we do with our hands matters. Radiation therapy is an excellent agent for local control, and it can be given preoperatively or postoperatively. Um, I am a big believer in preop radiation therapy. I don't think everyone has to have it, but certainly patients who have big, nasty tumors or near a joint or something like that, I'm always considering preop radiation therapy. I think chemotherapy should be based on two things: tumor histology and stage of tumor. So. I, I think that there are some histologies uh, that chemotherapy should be considered, e independent of stage. And lastly, as with uh, just about all cancers, biology determines outcome. So I, I thank you everyone for their attention. We have a few minutes to answer a few questions. I'll see if we can figure out how to do this. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and see if we can't go to the, uh, and open up to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Scoggins. That was uh, that was terrific and uh, a great overview of sarcoma for uh, for, uh, for everybody. Um, maybe you could talk about uh, one of the the most common tumors we see a little bit more uh, well differentiated liposarcoma and the role of radiation therapy there. Uh, your slide suggested that if the tumor is five point one centimeters in size with negative margins that they should all get radiation therapy. There's some data that suggests that radiation therapy for local control actually 
is more effective in low-grade tumor, low, tumors like liposarcoma than, than the high-grade tumors, which is counterintuitive to what we usually have, have considered. Uh, what are your thoughts about radiation therapy and, and treating those tumors? Um, as, you, as everyone knows, radiation therapy is a local treatment, like surgery. And a local treatment has the best chance for helping a patient if the disease problem is gonna be a local problem. So for a, the, the potential benefit of radiation is probably highest for a patient who has a low grade tumor. If you've got a very high grade tumor, the overall benefit of, to your life uh, is gonna be dictated by whether or not you develop metastatic disease mostly. So I think that there is definitely a role for radiation therapy for well-diff liposarcoma. Well-diff liposarcoma is going to be the one that most people see most of the time. And if, uh, if you can excise a small one with widely negative margins, I think that there's probably little benefit from radiation because those patients have little risk for local recurrence. Uh, if there's some factor in the patient's care that makes you think this particular patient is going to have a higher risk for local recurrence, like it's close to a structure, your margin was more narrow, uh, or, or it's a recurrence, then I, th I think that you're obligated to radiate that patient. The, the high-grade tumors do have a very high risk for local recurrence because of their nasty nature, so they, I think they do need radiation for sure. But the, the well-diff liposarcoma that we, that we see most commonly um, I, I, I have an internal discussion and I talk with the patients about radiation therapy, but if they've got a three centimeter tumor that we get out wide and negative margins, most of the time I do not refer those patients for radiation therapy. Um, if it's still a well diff liposarc and it's uh, a bit larger or closer to uh, one of the vital structures and my margin clearance was um, less than, than ideal, for example, if it came off of the, of the femur, and we had a very close margin there, I'm for sure radiating that patient because the risk of local recurrence is gonna be high. You have a few uh, questions on the chat, if you can see those. Or yeah, so read. Dr. Egger asked a tough one. Um, he says, for sarcomas that you perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy, one of the scare sarcomas, and, and, and the node comes back positive, is there a role for subsequent completion lymph node dissection? Then, uh, so I think that that the answer to that is probably yeah. If the patient has no distant metastatic disease and the regional nodal basin was the only site of disease, I would consider them for, for systemic therapy and a node dissection. Um, one, if the patient was a, was a bad candidate for the node dissection for some reason um, and they had a single node um, one might think about getting a PET scan, and if nothing else lit up, maybe you could observe that patient, but we have far less data uh, than we have for, say, melanoma to make those types of sophisticated, uh, you know, yes on this patient, no on this patient. We have just far less data to make those decisions. So, in general, when I have a scare sarcoma that has a positive sentinel node, I stage them thoroughly to make sure they don't have metastatic disease. We have discussion with med medical oncology about chemotherapy, and I, I typically take those patients for a completion lymph node dissection. Dr. Flynn asked uh, about the functional outcomes um, of these extremity sarcoma patients if you resect a four centimeter tumor with a two centimeter margin from the quadriceps muscle or hamstrings, how well do these people ambulate? It's, it's amazing how well people can ambulate uh, after some good physical therapy. I mean, you can remove a massive amount of thigh musculature and with some physical therapy, patients can ambulate. If you take the femoral nerve, the patient's probably gonna be in a knee brace, but I have a woman who works at the Ford, uh, the truck plant, she works at KTP, uh, every day, and we, where's her knee brace? And we resected a massive sarcoma out of her thigh, liposarcoma out of her thigh, and took the femoral nerve. You can take the sciatic nerve, and patients develop a foot drop, but they can, can wear an ankle brace and with physical therapy can ambulate. So um, uh, 
I would try to preserve uh, structures if possible, but if local control means taking a femoral nerve or a large amount of muscle or even a sciatic nerve, uh, I'm not going to let those things get in the way. Yeah, and that's a good common, physical therapy and a brace. A common board uh, question is, you know, uh, involvement of a sciatic nerve or femoral nerve and 